Good afternoon from Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm Ben Bohall with the Nebraska Forest Service, and this is Through the Thicket. We're live here every Thursday afternoon at 1230 Central Time. And uh, as always, we're here to talk about plants, uh, outdoor gardening, um, what have you. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. You can leave your comments or questions in the comment box below, and we'll do what we can to answer those during the episode today. I'm joined by Graham Herbst. He's our community forester for Eastern Nebraska. How's it going, Graham? Hey, it's great. I love this cool down a little bit. Um, you put away the above ground pool for the season. It's getting to be that time of year. So yeah, it's kind of nice to feel fall coming on. And it's, it's interesting because last week I've, I'm a big fan of the rain, but it was almost getting a little bit too chilly at times. So it's like, I thought I was ready for this, but maybe, <laughs> maybe not yet. And then now we're just kind of at that comfortable temperature now where it's just it's great to get outside and hopefully soon do some planting too yeah exactly you know that 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 rain was a bit excessive but it was so well timed for tree planting season which is kind of uh, i love because the fall is sort of a tree planting uh, it's a you know it's a time of year that we have all to ourselves for planting all the annual crops are done and um it's really just about the woodies and the perennials for getting in the ground this time of year so it's nice yeah and you're going to talk a little bit about tree biology today isn't that right yeah exactly and um but uh at, before i get into the topic itself i did have a funny for you oh okay um, what do you got you know pick your battles pick fewer battles than that put some battles back that's still too many battles <laughs> so this this was kind of a reminder to me that, uh, you know, as Ben knows and lots of you know, uh, I'm a talker. I'm a gum flapper of the first order. Uh, when we originally set out on the show, we, we had a goal of maybe 20, 30 minute episodes. And I've been pushing that quite a bit lately. So I need to, I need to pace myself a bit. So tree biology is something that we can kind of bite off in chunks and, and not try to do all at once in one long episode. So that's what I'm going to do is sort of... Um, go over some of the basics on, on tree anatomy, biology, and physiology. Um, this will be a review for a lot of you, but it's always good to start with fundamentals sometimes and, and go back over that stuff. And sometimes you'll come away with a little bit different perspective on, on how trees grow and what's going on when you're looking at them in the landscape. So uh, we'll get into tree biology and physiology here a little bit. Um, you know, obviously there are three main parts to a tree. There are many more than that, but we like to divide them up into sections. So we have the crown of the tree, which is the whole canopy would be another term for it. The trunk, which is the main stem, has a lot of parts that we're gonna talk about inside as well. And then of course the root system that um, gets the tree all the water and nutrition from the ground that it needs uh, to combine with the gases and the sunlight that it uses to make energy. So as we see in here, uh, you know, the crown has all your leaves, which are, of course, nature's original solar panel. Um, last I checked a while back, uh, solar technology is getting fairly close to the efficiency of, uh, of tree and plant foliage, but we still have not surpassed the ability of mother nature to harness energy from sunlight and store it. In the case of trees, we're storing that energy as carbohydrates and sugars, which makes, um, it's, it's very uh, desirable for other organisms, lots of insects, uh, small mammals, uh, fungi, they need that sugar and energy to, to grow because they can't make it themselves. And so uh, trees play a really vital role in ecosystems in that way. If I wanted to pull out my soapbox for just a quick second here, um, it's, it, it's really important as homeowners, as acreage owners, as farmers, as just stewards of the land, that we have some acceptable threshold of trees being used for food and for a place to live. Just because you see a little problem on your tree's leaves does not mean you need to come out and have somebody spray a pesticide or insecticide all over your yard um, lots of time, there are lots of insect and disease problems that are very minor stress factors, if a stress factor at all. And so there's a lot of coexistence going on that we have to allow to happen and maybe intervene when we have somebody that's knowledgeable about trees say, hey, you know, we've really reached a breaking point where your tree's going to start to see some problems if we don't uh, intervene somehow. 
And one, one more quick thought on that is that oftentimes insect and disease problems are not the initial cause. There's usually stress that builds up in a tree before insect and disease problems really become aggressive and, and uh, you know, sort of a threat to the tree's health. So it's good to play detective a bit in the landscape and see why is, why is the tree having a problem uh, with these insects or diseases. Now, there's stuff like bagworms where bagworms are just going to come and they're just going to eat foliage. Tent caterpillars, the same. You know, there's not any defenses a tree really has for those sort of problems. There's lots of other issues that are usually predicated by some stress that the tree is under, whether it's, and we've talked about a lot of those in the show already, uh, soil compaction, you know, de-icing salts accumulating, you know, physical damage just compromising how well the tree can feed all its processes. So um, we'll get back here to, to physiology, but I wanted to make a point there about how uh, trees are really a cornerstone organism for so many other organisms in the soil, in the air, uh, you know, birds, small mammals, insects, soil microbes, fungi, all these things uh, have very uh, strong and important relationships with trees. Trees are such big organisms that they're uh, critical in the landscape for all these other um, types of life that we share our cities and our acreages with. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the root system, as we say here, it's, it, it's designed to give structural support to the tree, keep it upright, if you will. It's also moving water and nutrients from the soil. It's storing a lot of energy. It's worth noting as well that the trunk and the crown do have energy stored in them as well. All the woody parts of the tree have energy stored in them. It's not just the root system, but there is this sort of seasonal movement of up from the roots in the spring as needed and back down into the root system in fall as things are sort of shutting down and at least slowing down uh, for the fall and winter. And the, in the diagram here, we'll be looking at, at these different parts in, in greater detail. I love this diagram also. And we, we, I used this same picture uh, when we were talking about containers, uh, the second part of that discussion two weeks ago um, in relation to considering a root that's growing outside of that, that root bag, the grow bags uh, that are used for trees sometimes. But now that we have the orientation up and down again, we're looking at the trunk of the tree. Um, I'm a pretty visual learner like most people, so the color coding uh, really helps us visualize what we're looking at. So if we start at the outside of the tree, we have the bark, okay? And the bark is the inner tissue that's, that's sort of uh, generated by the phloem. The bark and the phloem are all one and the same in some ways. The bark is sort of the, the non-living part that's used to protect the tree. It's sort of the skin of the tree, if you will, but it doesn't, uh, it's mostly comprised of dead cells that interface with the live tissue underneath, just like our skin does. Underneath the bark is the phloem, the blue that you see, and we have some arrows, again, showing how uh, the, the phloem, the, the way I remember which way this goes is I think of flowing down, you know, liquids tend to flow down, um, and, and that's true for the phloem. So when the, tree, when the tree canopy is making energy, and that energy is created and, and brought into the branches of, of the tree, then it's um, in that seasonal motion that I mentioned, it's moved downward through the phloem. So this is where all the, the stuff that's been made is being transported. And then inside of that is the red uh, layer called the xylem. The xylem is the tissue that's moving up as the arrows indicate. The water, the nutrients, um, those are all bring, being brought up from fine feeder roots in the soil through the xylem up to the tree to you know, allow photosynthesis to occur and complement the sunlight and gas exchange that's going on. So the same way that, that the phloem has this bark correlate to it that's fairly inert, uh, the xylem also has an inactive part that we consider to be the heartwood. So um, we have the xylem itself and then the active and inactive parts, which are the sapwood and the heartwood on the interior. So the sapwood is doing the movement that I mentioned of uh, material from the ground up 
and uh, the inactive heartwood is of course still providing structure to the tree and uh, sort of being decommissioned over time as the trunk continues to expand and grow then those layers of active tissue change over time from sapwood to heartwood. So this is really uh, evident in something like red cedar. Many people love the, the red tones inside of that wood. Uh, sometimes it's used to line you know, a linen closet, keep the moths away, things like that. And that really red portion is the heartwood where the sapwood has a lighter, more blonde color to it as it's, uh, and then it gets that color as it moves into the more inert heartwood function. Uh, there's also a note here on the bottom left. Uh, they may th these systems are not always arranged straight up and down. Some trees can have sort of a spiral grain to them, like a candy cane, or even a zigzag pattern. Although the the zigzag, I haven't personally um, seen that in in trees. Although I, I I know that it does occur. Sometimes it'll be moving sort of diagonally and change directions for one reason or another. Now, one bit of trivia on the spiral grain. This is not something that we see in a particular species of tree. You can have a stand of a whole lot of catalpa, for example, and some of them will have spiral grain and some won't. And I think that there's some theories about that, but not a real consensus on exactly why um, that would be that would occur. So there must be some sort of advantage to spiral grain as well as the straight grain and it's not being selected for so aggressively that we only end up with one or the other in a species. There also is a pith in, in the very center of, of uh, most trees. It's not gonna be really apparent in a lot, but we'll see an example of that in a minute. So this is just another nice example showing how the wood is arranged. We have uh, you know, the, the bark as you see, uh, I'll show with my cursor here. This is your phloem and your bark together is considered, um, you know, all the periderm and the secondary phloem. Vascular cambium we'll talk about in a second, so I'm going to breeze past that. And then we have the heartwood and the sapwood making up the two different types of xylem that the tree is producing as it grows. And uh, down below we have, we can see, again, this, this is very likely cedar, or maybe it looks more like oak, I guess. Um, the, the color difference between the sap and heartwood. So now we're looking at a um, linden. This is just a two year old stem, so a very small tree. Uh, we've, we've cut across through uh, the stem of the tree and we're looking down at it. Um, the reason we have these bright colors is because you can take an iodine mixture and stain uh, your little slice that you've taken out of the tree and that stain is going to be most apparent where we have energy stored, where we have sugars and carbohydrates. The iodine interacts uh, with that stored energy to show us where it's being stored. So in the case of linden, we do have a pretty obvious pith there in the center that's much more open. Uh, oftentimes in the case of like forsythia, this will be an actual open space without anything in the inside of it. It's a hollow, almost straw-like um, arrangement. So as we can see here, this is showing us that the, uh, the vascular cambium and the phloem has the energy moving through it, and that's where most of the iodine is showing us energy being stored, along with some on the interior uh, in the heartwood. It's worth noting, I, I think I've made this point in previous um, episodes of the show, but trees do not heal themselves. They only seal damage off. They grow over that damage, but the tissue underneath never is repaired and, and restored to the function that it served before. So all that living tissue is directly underneath the bark, and it's imperative to know this um, so that you can manage your, your uh, property uh, intelligently and, and not end up unnecessarily stressing or damaging your trees with lawn mowers, weed eaters, things of that nature. Um, I didn't throw them in here, but I have a lot of um, horrific examples of how trees are treated in construction zones, 
Uh, sometimes there's a curb that needs to go in and I have photos where people haven't even removed the tree entirely. They just cut a chunk, a chunk of, the, of the trunk away to make the space they need to put in a curb or, or what have you. So a lot of misunderstanding out there about what trees can, can tolerate and, and move through. We, you know, we see that I can carve my initials, Jimmy loves Jenny, and the tree more or less lives on you know, in spite of that, but they are tenacious organisms that uh, can tolerate a lot. But um, the more of that live tissue right underneath the bark you take away, the harder it's going to be for the tree to continue to grow and do well. So this is a really important slide here. Um, a meristem is basically the, a, a place on the plant where active cell growth and elongation is occurring. So unlike most plants, uh, trees and shrubs that, that produce branches, woody tissue that persists above ground from year to year, we have three meristems with woody plants where tender herbaceous plants only have two. So the apical and the root meristems are universal for all plants, the apical being at the very tips of all the shoots, those are continuing to add cells and, and elongate, and the tip of the root as well. So back to the analogy of carving your you and your sweetheart's initials in the tree. If I do that as a 13-year-old boy and I go revisit that tree 20 years later out of nostalgia, those initials are still gonna be at the same height that they were when I carved them. The tree does not grow from the base. It's the, it's the ends of the branches that actually grow. And so it's, it's important to keep that in mind in terms of how these meristems actually work. So there's obviously other meristems further back. If we look at this terminal bud here, that is a meristem. There are also buds further back on the branch that are also meristems because the tree branch is going to branch, of course, and uh, produce more growth that way as well. Uh, but down here in the rectangle, we do not have a meristem that's adding height to the tree here. What we do have is a lateral meristem that's adding another layer to the stem. You could think of this like a plant that's growing another plant on the outside of it every year. Those, those annual growth rings that we associate with trees. This, is, this lateral meristem is the, the mechanism for those annual growth rings occurring. And if I go back a, a couple slides here and we look at this vascular cambium, this is where that meristem occurs. So in this green layer right here, we have cells differentiating and turning, you know, a lot of talk about stem cell research these days for people and animals, these cells that are sort of basic and they can morph into lots of different types of cells and they're very utilitarian that way. So in, in this, in this, um, meristem that we have for woody plants, this green layer that we see, the vascular cambium, on one side of it we are creating new phloem, the, the, the transport uh, cells that move the energy into storage into the root system, and on the other side we have the xylem being produced, and so uh, th there's, a, there's a layer and there's new tissue being added on both sides, and that's what's creating that thickening of the trunk over time and those, and those growth rings um, expanding. So uh, that's, that's what makes trees and woody shrubs unique to other plants and allows them to uh, grow new living tissue on the outside and be more resilient against really cold and really hot temperatures, uh, things like that. So even though trees don't heal, they have this wonderful ability to generate new living tissue and, and leave the old behind. So that it's, it's and, and that's something that we don't really have. We, if, if, if we lose a finger, uh, the finger doesn't grow back. So um, there's, a, there's a trade off here be, in, between the way that plants and animals respond to damage. And this has a lot of implications for pruning concepts that we talked about in a previous episode, and I'm sure we'll cover again down the road. So when we're talking about the organs of a tree, 
we can basically break those up into vegetative and reproductive. So vegetative meaning organs that are um, there for growth, and then reproductive organs are of course uh, designed to uh, reproduce and make new plants instead of upkeep the one that, that uh, we're looking at in one case or the other. So the vegetative is the leaves, the roots, the stems, all the parts of the tree other than the flowers, which then ripen into fruit with seed inside of it. It's worth noting that all, um, all trees and uh, shrubs have flowers of some sort. Uh, this is a, a, a evolutionary adaptation that came on the scene about, if I remember right, about 100 to 150 million years ago when flowering plants first, first came. Before that, we had a lot of, if you know what horsetail rush looks like, or ferns, uh, palms, things like that. Th these were very simple plants that didn't rely on um, wind or insects to help them reproduce. So it wasn't until a plant started to develop a flower that was sort of attractive to another organism that we started to see an advantage to having that correlation between the plant and some other type of life other than the plant itself. So all plants, you know, other than ferns and some of those kind of really old, you know, uh, long lived, uh, organisms that have been on the planet for a long time, um, all of our shrubs and uh, trees have flowers to them. Those flowers all ripen into a fruit of some sort, whether we're talking about an acorn, a crab apple, a, uh, a samara on, you know, a whirly gig on a maple tree, um, or just some sort of a, like a, like a pine cone. These are all just different types of fruits. And, um, so we're using fruit really broadly, the same way you can you can blow a little kid's mind explaining how a tomato is a fruit, right? Or an olive is a fruit. Because it's the part of the plant that's reproductive. It's not the leaves, it's not the roots, it's not the stem. So anything that, that's uh, coming from the flowers and turning into fruit with seeds inside is reproductive. Uh, here we're looking at a, uh, a twig diagram. In this case, we're looking at walnut. We have that real distinct uh, fruit. We can call it a nut, and that is more specific, but in the broad general sense, this is a tree fruit. Um, we have the terminal bud, as we mentioned before, which is where the meristem occurs. If we're looking at this branch in the springtime, then this terminal bud is, is what's going to uh, get longer and add length to the branch. It's also gonna grow buds behind it that branch as well as we see down here. So there are lateral buds that are also gonna elongate into side branches. We have a bud scale scar. And what that is, is it's showing us the, uh, the, the, the terminal bud has a scale over it that's going to protect it from the cold over the winter time before it emerges next spring. And so when that bud scale falls off in the springtime, it leaves a scar behind. Now, why is this important? Well, because this bud scale scar shows us where the terminal bud was last year, which means that the distance between this bud scale scar and the terminal bud is the growth that the tree put on last year. So if we can identify where the scar is, in previous years, then we can identify how the growth rate of the tree is changing over time. We can look into the past and the tree can tell us whether it put on more growth one year than another. This doesn't necessarily mean that the tree is healthy or not. This is very correlated to rainfall, the same way that growth rings in the tree are thicker when we have more rainfall. Uh, but it is a good piece of information as we're looking around the landscape and looking at our trees and trying to figure out what might be going on if there's a problem or just monitoring the trees uh, because we love them so much and we want to uh, stay on top of things. There's also a leaf scar and we can see that really close here. Walnut has a very distinct leaf scar. Uh, this is where the base of a leaf attached to the branch and then fell off in the fall as the tree went dormant. And you'll see some strange circles in here. 
uh, some people think of this as like a, a monkey face or whatever sort of uh, funny way you can remember what that looks like. It's an identification feature for walnut, but not for a lot, lots of other trees where they're uh, pretty nondescript looking. Uh, but we can see the, the, the vascular tissue inside here that was, that was feeding uh, the leaf with water and nutrients and taking the energy that it produced and bringing it back into the woody parts of the plant to store it. And then, of course, as fall comes, that leaf um, desiccates and falls off the branch and leaves behind this leaf scar. Um, any, any point where we have a bud on the branch we call a node, and the space in between nodes we call the internode. And so this can be helpful for uh, describing the tree. Does it have long inner nodes or short ones? It, are, the, are the nodes clustered really closely together for some reason? Um, sometimes this is a feature that can tell us whether a tree's had some herbicide damage. Um, herbicide damage can cause those inner nodes to lengthen and we have really long floppy growth out of the tree when otherwise it would have uh, shorter inner nodes that give it a, a more sturdy structure to it. Um, again, lateral buds coming off of a lateral branch. Those lateral shoots do have a terminal bud as well. So we can't think of it as just being at the tip. It's at the tip of every twig that branches off on its own. And so here's another bundle scar. And uh, the last one I'll mention is lenticels. And these aren't very evident in the picture. Uh, walnut doesn't uh, represent them very well either. But lenticels are gas exchange organs that are on the woody parts of the tree. We think of most of the gas exchange occurring in the root system and in the leaves, but in uh, trees like cherry or crab apple, we can often see very obvious lenticels. Usually they're kind of white specks on the bark, and there's actually gas exchange going on uh, in the, the woody part of the tree as well through those lenticels. The correlate to that on the leaves is the stomates that, that are uh, mouths, if you will, that open and close with day and nighttime and they open to transpire moisture um, and exchange gases. Um, we generally talk about trees as having two different types of growth. Uh, this also gets back to some of the pruning concepts that we discussed. An X current tree is what we see on the left where we have a very strong central leader, one trunk that's guiding the growth of the tree and lots of branch, subordinate branches off of that that are smaller in diameter and shorter in length and uh, that dominant leader. On the right side, we have decurrent growth, which is more like a head of broccoli or this kind of rounded crown. Um, Sometimes trees develop decurrent growth because they are planted all by themselves instead of with other trees packed in close together. And other times that's just sort of their general tendency. So the, the example of linden that I used in my pruning uh, talk, we, when linden is growing in a forest, it's very excurrent. We have a very strong leader to it because they're all packed together these lateral branches are not getting a lot of sunlight, and so they're not growing longer and thicker. But when we plant linden all by itself, we get a much more decurrent structure to it. So it's just nice to have words for these forms, even though uh, some trees can take on one form or another depending on the context that they're growing in. Uh, as, as far as leaf types, we do have, of course, conifers, and broadleaf trees. Conifers are mostly evergreen, meaning they're gonna hold on to all those uh, 12, 12 months a year. Um, they'll, they'll shed needles um, periodically with something like white pine, for example. We usually have the interior needles being shed off when they get to be about three to five years old. So it's um, with, with pine for, for this example, we have lots of needles on the outside and as the older needles are shaded out and become less efficient in photosynthesis than they're shed in the fall uh, on the inside of the tree. And we get a lot of phone calls from people seeing yellow needles inside their white pine that are falling and they're concerned. 
And uh, sometimes that's a cause for concern, but usually it's just a very natural process that it's going through shedding those needles that are a few years old. Uh, th these can be scale-like. If you're familiar with um, arborvitae, for example, or some junipers, they don't have needles as much as these rounded structures that are, that are needle-like, uh, but just different enough that we call them a scale instead. And conifers all have a cone. Uh, so this is a, a structure that has lots of scales with a seed inside of each scale. Now broadleaf trees are newer on the scene. If we think back to that evolutionary time scale, uh, broadleaf trees are a fairly new adaptation where plants figured out that there is an advantage sometimes to having the ability to grow leaves and then drop them all every year and then grow new. Um, these, are, these leaves are shed every fall, so the tree has kind of a dormant period. Um, the, Obviously, it's a disadvantage in some ways to have to put energy into growing new leaves every year, but it's also an advantage to not have to keep that foliage uh, hydrated and alive through difficult times of the year like the winter. This is why we always recommend that in fall, when you're getting ready to put those garden hoses away for the winter, that's the best time to really get a lot of water down on your trees especially those conifers that have needles they're gonna keep on all winter that need moisture in order to stay, uh, keep from drying out. And broadleaf trees typically have flat leaves rather than the uh, scales or needles that are more long and multi, you know, three, four sided most of the time. Now we do have some exceptions to that rule. We do have some broadleaf tree or trees and shrubs that hold their leaves all year. So we call these uh, broadleaf evergreens. They're not conifers because we still don't have needles on them, but they do hold these leaves all year. So most people will be familiar with barberry on the left. Uh, these come in colors of dark red, yellow, and green. So they're, they're used pretty commonly. They have small little thorns to them. On the right, we have Euonymus. Um, winter creeper is the one that most people have probably seen because, again, of that yellow or that uh, purple foliage color that, that people find attractive. This is an, a different one with a green and uh, white variegation. So these are broadleaf plants, but they're evergreen as well. And they hold their strategy is to hold those leaves from year to year through the winter. Uh, another example is some of the hollies. We can't grow a lot of hollies here the way they can back east with more acidic soils, but we do have, uh, you know, winterberry holly on, on the left and uh, a, another one on the right here. These are also plants that are broadleaf evergreens, and that's their strategy, which doesn't mean they're going to do it every year. We still do have nasty winters that may cause some of these plants to drop leaves when it's particularly bad, but the plant itself is intending to keep those leaves on all winter. <sighs> now we can grow Oregon grape holly. This is another example of a broadleaf evergreen, uh, but we don't grow them. Uh, you know, the, it, it really struggles in, in our part of the country and uh, in the Pacific Northwest, as the common name of Oregon grape holly tells us, we get this beautiful plant that has a nice flower display, a beautiful fruit display, beautiful fall color, uh, just a nice plant that you should consider trying if you have a nice protected spot with good soil. Um, but the average spot in, in a, a residential landscape uh, may not be really well suited for a plant like this, but what a beautiful one to be able to pull off in the landscape if you have the right location. On the other end of the spectrum, we do also have some conifers that are deciduous. So they have needles like conifers do, but their strategy is to drop them all every year. And the, the, the tragic part of this strategy is that oftentimes these trees are cut down unnecessarily because we're so familiar with spruce and pine and fir that has needles that persist from year to year that people, maybe they buy a new home and they don't know what tree they have and they see it drop all of its needles and they hire somebody to come and cut the tree down, mistaking it for a dead tree, when in fact it's just doing what it's, what it's uh, evolved to do. So on the left we have bald cypress, um, a beautiful tree that can grow in lots of spots, 
um, pretty well adapted to the eastern half of the state at least. And uh, if you are watching a movie that takes place in Louisiana, Alabama, you know, you're in the swamps and you see all these trees with the really wide fluted bases growing right out of the water, that's bald cypress. On the right, we have um, larch, which there are both um, European and American species of. And this is another one that is a conifer that will drop all of its needles each year. For my species highlight, uh, this is a third um, deciduous conifer, if you will. Uh, some people actually consider ginkgo to be a, a, a deciduous broadleaf tree. It's kind of a uh, botanical argument that continues. Uh, ginkgo biloba, as the Latin name implies, biloba meaning two lobed, we can see the arrangement of the leaves into two lobes over time as they get longer. This is not uh, uniform throughout the tree. We can see other leaves that don't have that lobe through the middle. Uh, but what's, what's I mean, the, this leaf is not one that you're gonna mistake for anything else. It's very uh, characteristic, uh, the, bu the buds, that they uh, that the leaves originate from are very large and pronounced, and that's another identification feature. Um, but this is uh, this is arguably a broadleaf con or a, a deciduous conifer because, uh, and, I, and I guess this photo isn't showing it very well. But the leaf vein, the veins in the leaves are not branching and intersecting with each other; they're all parallel. And so uh, the argument is that these are actually needles that are fused together into a single leaf. So if we look at, uh, I'll go back to white pine as an example. If this branch were from a white pine, then we would have a bud right here, and it would have a bundle of five needles coming out of it. There isn't a bud for every single needle on the tree. They, they're, they're formed in bundles from a single bud, and, and so uh, it's, it's easy to see how this tree could potentially be uh, growing a lot of needles that are actually all fused together to look like a broadleaf leaf uh, when in fact it's a conifer because the, the veins of the leaf are not connecting and branching together the way most other trees do. Uh, this is a very, very old tree, about um, 150 to 200 million years old been around longer than crocodiles. Um, it coexisted with lots of the uh, dinosaurs and megafauna that, uh, that are not with us any longer. Uh, in the left here, you can see the uh, state champion ginkgo in Forest Lawn Cemetery with its companion tree on the other side, giving you a sense of the size that we can expect out of a tree like this, usually about 40 to 60 foot by 30 to 50 foot wide if you give it time. It's a nice slow grower, which most people don't like, but I think is more of a feature uh, than a problem. Um, the long-lived nature of this tree on the planet is a testament to it having very few, I mean, I don't know of any insect or disease problems that this tree ever gets. And same with urban stress, some of the abiotic problems that lots of trees have. Um, this tree is not picky about soil types, uh, soil pH, um, you know, it's not going to like being in really waterlogged soil all the time, uh, but it's very, very adaptable and a tree that we should be considering more. Um, the fruit that you see here is a, um, it's, it's sort of a stone fruit, kind of like a cherry. We have a hard nut on the inside with a fleshy covering on the outside. Now, I have heard lots of descriptions about what this fleshy outer uh, covering of the, of the nut inside smells like. Um, and sometimes when I get too descriptive about it, people call me out and ask me how I even know what that smells like. So um, vomit, dog vomit, um, you know, garbage. Uh, the, the flesh on the outside of this nut, if I could just summarize, it's not pleasant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting when you said people call me out. I'm like, where is he going to go with this? So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you can you can come up with the most descriptive way of um, conveying what this smells like, and um, yeah, it, it just doesn't do it justice. When I was um, 
when I was in the private sector working for a tree service, we had one customer who had a ginkgo uh, right by their front door. And we would actually use a hormone-based product to discourage the tree from setting fruit. And um, one year that, 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 was, that injection wasn't done timely and, the, and it had a bunch of fruit. And of course, this happens around Halloween when kids are coming up to the door and back and trampling on this seed and smelling it and getting it everywhere. And so uh, guess who got to go with a rake and a tarp and pick up all that fruit? Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> that a, sounds like a blast. Yeah, it was, it was, not, it was not a fun uh, thing. <clears throat> but um, that being said, the nut on the inside is a valuable uh, food source for lots of Asian cultures. So if you can get past the smell of the outer coating and get that off, um, you, you're left with a beautiful silvery nut inside uh, that can be roasted, I think, is mostly how it's used for, for eating. Um, and just a wonderful tree all around. If you Once we get past this fleshy, awful smelling outside to the fruits. Now, the other saving grace is that this is a dioecious tree, meaning that we have separate male and female trees. So one ginkgo tree is only gonna have male or female flowers, not both. So in the industry, we're typically selling male um, clones of ginkgo to ensure that we're not gonna get those fruits uh, on them if you wanna plant that tree in the landscape, which is nice. Um, it does have a, uh, an overall structure that can be problematic as we see in the picture on the bottom. Uh, lots of co-dominant leaders, but, it, but I don't see a lot of branches breaking out of these trees the way we would with something like calorie pear or the linden that's growing all by itself with that lots of that decurrent growth or ash would be another example so even though it has this structure that that uh seasoned arborists look at and may kind of you know have some concern um it doesn't really have the same history of branch failure that a lot of other trees do that have this structure. Now I mentioned this is a particularly old tree. Uh, for practical purposes, we consider ginkgo to be an Asian native, uh, but it has been on the planet so long that we do find it in the fossil record in North America. So um, if you wanna cast your net wide enough in time, you can think of this as a North American native tree, uh, but it vanished from the continent uh, when the continents uh, diverged from each other, and it's now uh, been reintroduced to North America by a couple different methods. So a really, really interesting tree. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, extremes in terms of being really resilient and tough and adaptable, uh, having an edible nut, but a disgusting outside to the, to the nut that you have to get past. Uh, so just a really cool tree that we should be planting. It's very tolerant of our urban uh, settings and our stress factors that we have in the city. Um, but it doesn't, aside from the beautiful buttery yellow fall color, it doesn't have a lot of the ornamental traits that people are excessively looking for in trees. We got to get past the, the fall color and the spring flowers when we're deciding what tree to choose for our landscape and think about the diversity the adaptability, the need for trees that grow slower and, and mature over a, a longer period of time. And so with that, uh, you know, again, I, like, I, like I promised, we were just getting into a little bit of the tree physiology and botany. We will continue and get into greater depth in this topic in future episodes. Um, are you seeing anything in the chat, Ben? Yeah, I've actually, I've got a few questions. The first one I'm wondering, and this, you alluded to this at the beginning of the episode, where you had said something along the lines of, or I guess comparing, I got to think of the right way to articulate this. I guess, what is the relationship between, you know, a tree's health, you know, and the possibility that it's going to be attacked by an insect? You know, I think of like Japanese beetle, you know, and lindens, or obviously emerald ash borer, and, you know, ash trees. If a tree is, is unhealthy, is it more likely to, to be attacked by these, these bugs? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, typically, I, I get questions a lot about whether to fertilize trees, and I'm going to get to your point here. 
uh, and, and I'm mostly not in favor of fertilizing trees unless we have an obvious symptom in the tree that we're trying to address. So trees can show you in their leaves that they're deficient in one macro or micronutrient. And we can give that to them in order to address that issue. But generally speaking, we want to let the trees decide how fast or slow to grow. If we don't do that, if we stimulate the tree with lots of uh, nitrogen in a, you know, fertilizer for the lawn or, or what have you, um, then we've, we've uh, forced the tree to take energy away from um, protecting itself from insect and disease problems and put that into growth. So maybe in a future episode, what we'll do is we'll talk about the hierarchy of energy allocation. So there are different things the tree uses energy for, and there's a, there's a sort of um, a, a list of priorities that the tree has. And one's gonna be met first, and then the next, and then the next, and then the next. And if we, if we stimulate the tree with lots of fertilizer, then we're changing those priorities and getting them out of whack from what the tree knows that it needs to do. So um, it's interesting to look at how much growth the tree puts on from one year to the next, but that's not necessarily an indicator of health, right? Because we can have a wet year where the tree, um, the, the branches get longer and a dry year where, they, where they're shorter. We could think of trees like Methuselah as a, as a famous um, uh, bristlecone pine in uh, the Black Hills. It's hundreds, potentially thousands of years old, and it's maybe 30 feet tall, okay? Now that's not because it's in bad health, it's because it's, a, it's uh, responding to the amount of resources that it has available to grow. And if we went in and started injecting a bunch of fertilizer to make Methuselah grow faster, that would not be doing the tree any favors. Um, so I, I think that kind of gets to what you're, what you're asking about. And I think we should definitely drill down on that more uh, in a future episode. That's a great topic. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and thank you for kind of explaining that. Um, a, another question we have here is, do you think that if a tree's leaves don't have a chance to create an abscission layer in order to drop the leaves and they persist into the following spring, that they could impact spring leaf out? Um, I, I don't think so. Uh, if, if they don't, no, no abs, abscission layer refers to the leaf sort of drying out and creating that spot where the leaf scar is left behind and, and, the, and the leaf uh, detaches from the branch. So um, lots of times when that doesn't happen, it's an indicator of some kind of problem in the tree. Uh, the, the, leaf, the leaf died prematurely before uh, the environment was stimulating that abscission layer to occur. So it, it is a good telltale sign that there's probably something going wrong in the tree. Um, but I don't think it's gonna have any impact on, on leaf out the following year because if I, uh, if I go back in, in my slides and we'll look at this walnut, uh, the abscission layer occurs here where the leaf scar is and that it, it, the, the bud for next year is not behind that, it's above it. And so if that leaf remains where this leaf scar is right now, that's not going to inhibit the new bud swelling and opening up and producing that new branch or leaf. So it may not be a problem for next year's growth, but it is still a good warning flag that there might be something going on in the tree to be looked at. Sometimes we can get a, a really cold temperature swing you know, we can, uh, uh, you know, we've had a couple Easter freezes, for example, where it got warm, the trees were stimulated to break dormancy and, and grow leaves, and then it gets cold again really fast. And sometimes they'll, they'll hold on there. Uh, herbicide damage can do this sometimes. Um, so a number of reasons that you might want to be concerned, but, I, but next year's foliage, I guess, isn't the primary concern. All right. Well, definitely an interesting episode, Graham. I think sometimes uh, maybe we don't necessarily think that trees are the complex creatures that we are, but they, they certainly are. So this was very, very educational. Um, looking ahead to next week, do we know what we're talking about yet? Or are we going to kind of play it by ear? Yes, we do. We do. Uh, okay. My, my cohort, Bob Hendrickson, which a lot of you know, he runs the horticulture program for the statewide arboretum, a good friend and colleague. Uh, he and I are heading down to Richardson County to look at a very special uh, stand of trees or revisit 
uh, a special stand of trees, uh, collect some fruits so that we can grow more of these wonderful trees, which I uh, will not spoil right now. Uh, so we're doing that next Tuesday. I'm gonna take some video in the field and uh, either just myself or I'll see if Bob's available to join us on the show to talk about what we did, what we're doing and why. And um, it'll be a good one. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a great episode. Definitely an interesting topic. Um, if you are out there and you are watching the show, uh, you know, we welcome you to, to share it with your friends. You know, we're trying to get uh, as much uh, exposure as possible with the program. You know, we obviously like doing it, but we also love hearing from you. So if you guys have feedback or questions, feel free to, uh, to post those in the comment box below. You can also uh, shoot us an email at our official email account. That's trees at unl.edu. Graham, thanks again, my friend. I hope you have a good rest of your week, and, uh, and we'll be talking again soon. Enjoy this weather. Yeah, you too, Ben. Thanks, everybody. See you later.